You remember last week, we were in the middle of our series on the Lord's Prayer, and we talked about praying for the facility that God's having us build, the building God's having us build, and, and uh, asking that you guys, whether it's in your small groups or whether you're just meeting with someone else or whether the conversation comes up, but whenever to be praying for those things specifically, for that specifically. And um, it was funny because right after I preached that sermon, you know, pray, 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 uh, on Monday I went to go to someone's house and I was counseling with them and we were going through some stuff. And at the end, I prayed uh, for them. And when I finished, he looked at me and goes, really, you're not going to pray for the building? And I was like, oh, man. So I got called out, guys. So I, I want to call you out by getting called. The rest of the week, I did really good. So I want to encourage you that um, as you go throughout these next few months, that you, anytime you can, you remember and you pray 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 this morning we are we read our scripture together um, at, at this time of our service and we're reading Hebrews 1 1 through 3 we're talking um, and, and we're going to celebrate communion at the end of the service and so here we we see a story of who Jesus was and is to us will you read this with me long ago God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets and now, in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance, and through the son, he created the universe. The son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. Amen. You know, it's good to know that our mediator and the one who paid for our sins sits at the right hand of God. And so this morning, may we glorify him in everything we do, in our song and in our words. Will you pray with me? Father, you are exalted. God, we ask you to continue to exalt your name through us, through our words, through our actions. Lord, may we recognize this morning that you have also glorified your son who sits at your right hand. And Father, may your son receive glory today in what we do and what we say. And as we take communion at the end of this service, may we truly remember what he did for us and that we can sing in hope and in freedom. Lord, may we do that in our spirit, not caught up in the things of this world or anything else that would hold us back from recognizing and expressing what you deserve, all glory and honor. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Let's all stand and sing together. Gathered to worship God, amen. Recognize God for who He is. Out of His great love, He sent His Son. Let's sing. We waited for this day, we're gathered in Your name, calling out to You. Your glory like a fire, awakening the will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our prayer. Presence. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Descended like a cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here, you're the reason we're singing. 
good to praise the Lord with you this morning. You know, the truth is Jesus Christ will be magnified forever. He reigns in glory today. And he will reign forever. One day we will reign with him. Let's magnify Jesus together this morning. Lord, we maybe see a little more clearly today. For some of us, a lot more clearly who you truly are. The creation suddenly articulate with the thousand tongues to lift one cry from north to south and east to west we dear Christ be of our sin, oh God, we can shine bright for you in the light of your love and your purity. I won't bow down to others, I stand strong and worship you, and if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice as you're there too. I won't be for my feelings, I hold fast the world is true. If the cross Oh, 
that is the prayer that truly honors the Lord. The righteous desire, the right desire to glorify Jesus. Let's declare together that he is the one true God. As we come to you this morning, we acknowledge that you are the one true God. We acknowledge that you are the light of the world. We acknowledge that you are the one way of salvation. Lord, as we come to you this morning, as we listen to your word, as we hear from your spirit, may we, may we be the vessels that you need. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. You guys can be seated. So I'm not going to ask any hands this time, but often I start with a question. And, and the question is this. Have you ever said out loud or in your heart, I can never forgive blank? I can never forgive blank. Maybe that person was, did something that just awful to you. Maybe they, they stole something from you or they took something from you or they stole your reputation by saying bad stuff about you. Maybe it's somebody who was really, really close to you. In fact, most often that's exactly the person. I mean, if it's somebody from far away, it's, it's hard to not really even let it go eventually because it's not that, uh, you don't, aren't reminded of it constantly. But sometimes that might have even been said between spouses. You know, you're like, I will never forgive you. I will never forgive you. You know, those are words that come from deep hurt and deep anguish. And they're words that, if we were to be honest, all of us have probably said that or thought it at one time. And so this morning, as we continue in our series on the Lord's Prayer, uh, we come to a spot that seems just a little bit um, frustrating or out there. It's in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, and Jesus is going through and he's been saying, now pray this prayer, pray this this way. He says, Father is in heaven, hallowed be your name. We've talked about those. Your kingdom, uh, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this, our need, oh, give us our daily needs as, um, you know what? I was laughing this morning. I told the uh, I told Pat. I said, you know what? My mind's like working at a at a like you know you, you most people who are younger wouldn't even remember the record player where you turned it so slow and your mind's like wee. So forgive me, forgive me, my debts. As right now I'm I'm at another level, but we do get to Matthew chapter six verse twelve, and Jesus says this, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now that's weird. Because we think debts, well, what does the biblical definition here of debt mean? See, the Bible has, has laid out that sin or, or things we do against God causes us to have a debt. That it becomes a bill to be paid. And when you might be here and you might not, you might go, what does sin mean? Sin is used, a Greek word is used that means it's like shooting an arrow, and there's a target, and there's a bullseye. And if you miss the bullseye exactly, that's sin. So what God declares is, I have a will for you, and if you miss that will, if you put yourself up against that will, if you choose your own way versus my way, you sin. And, and there's two kind of types of sin. We talk most often about sins of commission, which means stuff I do that God says don't do. You know, we like to look up the Ten Commandments and say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And we say, okay, well, if I've done that, that's a sin of commission. But really one that we don't talk about a lot is sins of omission. And that's the idea where God does tell us to do things and we don't do those. And any time we sin, any time we go against his will, he says there's a debt. A debt that's owed. A bill comes due. And then we see the word forgive, and, and we have to understand, well, what does it mean? What type of uh, forgive does that mean? And, and the understanding that forgive us our debts, it's not a forgetting it. See, sometimes we, we talk about forgiveness as, oh, if you really forgive somebody, you'll just forget. Well, let me tell you, I have a human mind, and if the hurt is deep enough, no matter if I actually forgive, my emotions sometimes and my mind can still replay it. In fact, as I talk through this right now, as we walk through this together, you're going to be brought up some things that really hurt you, and you're going to remember them. You haven't forgotten. And, and forgiveness isn't not just forgetting. It's also not like saying, oh, it's okay. We, we, we make excuse for it. We say, oh, well, we're going to just, we're just going to act like it never happened. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is the idea that the debt is either paid or, or taken off the books. That's the definition of forgiveness. It, it is not just letting it go in a sense of like, oh, I'm just supposed to forget. It's having the debt be wiped off the books. 
either by being paid or released. And so here, Jesus says, we're supposed to pray. Now, we know that Jesus had no debts compared with the Father, right? Jesus was sinless. But he says, this is how we pray, and forgive us our debts as we have also have forgiven our debtors. Now, here's the thing. You might ask this question, but pastor... I thought that when we talk about sins and forgiveness, that once I have been, you know, once I I come to faith in Jesus Christ, once I believe what Jesus did was enough, like, doesn't that already wipe all my debts out? And that's why, because here, the way this forgiveness is, there's two types of forgiveness. There is legal forgiveness. Now, legal forgiveness is the idea that legally, like under the judge, the judge says we're guilty of these sins, of these things, and we're legally, we have to pay, and what we know through Scripture is none of us can pay, but those are legal debts. So when Jesus came, and in faith, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, those debts are paid. Not only are they wiped off the books, but it says we actually receive the righteousness of Jesus. So here, the kind of forgiveness, that's legal forgiveness. But that's not the kind of forgiveness that's talking about here. This is relational forgiveness. This is fellowship forgiveness that Jesus is talking about. This is the connection of our intimacy with our Father. See, remember what he prays at the beginning? Our Father. This is assuming we are already connected to the Father. That we are children. So now, our Our idea of being children, that no matter what we do, we will always be children, and that has been paid, all our sins have been paid, past, present, and future, so that's guaranteed, I go to heaven, but on this side of eternity, my fellowship with my Father is still always ongoing. We know this because we know when we're struggling in something, we will often feel distant from God. When we're sinning against Him purposefully or we're choosing to sin because we'd rather do that, we feel distant from God. And it's the same way in your marriage when you have uh, hurt one another, you feel distant. I mean, the idea that somehow our, our, our sins, we just ignore them and they go away, doesn't happen. We know that in our own relationships with people, and in the same way, God says that there's, yes, there's the legal forgiveness that you get immediately for all time, like, that's done, but as we walk out our faith, and as we walk out our relationship with God, our fellowship can get interrupted, our intimacy can be strained because we continue to sin against Him, and so Jesus says, we need to pray and forgive us our debts as we have also forgive, forgiven our debtors. Now, I want to go to uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, because Paul talks about this debt from a legal sense. He says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away. He has nailed it to the cross. But then he says in 1 John 1, 9, he says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Here, John, if you read the verses above, he's talking about fellowship with God. Yes, Paul says our legal indebtedness is done, but here he says we're always going to be called to, when we sin, to confess our sins. We, taught, we had an entire sermon back right before Easter where we talked about what is confession and repentance and why do we do it. And here he says if we confess our sins. Now remember, right before this he says if you are in fellowship or walk in darkness, you're not walking with the Lord. And, and he says, and if you're walking in light, you are. And the idea is our fellowship is constrained or multiplied by how we're walking with God. And when we sin, the call on our lives is not to just kind of walk through it and go, I'm okay. You know, I think as, as believers, many of us, we, I talk to people and they feel disconnected from God. And really what it comes down to, a big part of it is they have chosen to do something they know offends God. But in their sense that it's all been forgiven, they can just keep walking it out as long as they want. And God says, no, yeah, your, your legal 
Forgiveness is done. But our relationship depends on our intimacy and our fellowship. And when you continually sin against me, it affects it. Now, the fact of the matter is, we as a culture, we as churches, and I'm talking about like the church overall, has begun to say um, the way God's called us to live is a democracy. And we can get together and we can vote and we can say, hey, we've changed the rules, God. We like this. We want to accept this. We want to say, you used to say that this is wrong. But you know what? Enough of us have gotten together and we've declared that this is no longer sin. And the reason why we do that is we'd rather not have to confess sin. We'd rather rationalize it. We'd rather, if we're, especially when we're struggling in something, rather than try to get away from it, we just call it something different. But God declares in his word that he is the only arbiter of what is sin and what is not. He's the only one who gets to declare right from wrong. He's the only one who, when it comes, he's able to say this is the truth. And let me tell you, it's not capricious. He doesn't do it to try to go, you know what? I'm going to call this truth and this not truth, this sin and this not sin. And then I'm just going to confuse everybody and hope they live by what I say. He says, I, remember earlier we looked, I've created in Hebrews, he said, through Christ, I created the entire world. I know how it works. And the way I call you to live isn't because I'm some kind of capricious and I want to catch you doing wrong. It's because that's the best way to live. That's what is going to get you the farthest in my kingdom. That's what's going to lead you in intimacy with me. That's going to help you in a relationship with others. Now, the world's going to always push back against that. But God says, I've created it this way. And so we sit here and, and, and we kind of struggle with the idea of the relational thing. But we know that it starts, the forgiveness he talks about, it starts not just with our relationship with him. But it also, our, our fellowship with him, we're going to see is affected by our fellowship with others. In fact, this is going to make us very uncomfortable. Because many of us, when we walk through our fellowship and our forgiveness with others, we struggle. Some of us think that we want to hold on to the debts that people owe us. And the Bible says, you know, forgive us our debts as we forgive others who what? Have debts against us. Meaning, we all are kind of creditors at times. And people have sinned against us. People have done things against us. And we like to hold those debts because it's kind of the trump card. Right? Somebody hurt us deep enough and we're like, oh yeah. When, when they say, well, you hurt me. You're like, well, I remember when you hurt me at this date, at this time. And I'm going to always use it and you're never going to get away. And there it is. And, and we like the trump card, and we like the idea, and by the way, we're horrible auditors. We're horrible at accounting. Have you ever noticed that your bank statement of debt is always positive on your end and negative on everyone else? Have you ever noticed that? That somehow the way the scoring always works for you is you've done less to the person, other person. Have you ever wondered what their scoring looks like? It's probably different. You're, you're sitting by, some of you are sitting by your spouse right now, and in your mind, you probably think, I've been the better spouse, and your other spouse thinking the exact same thing. We're just not good score. We don't, we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. Everything we do wrong, we think, well, I meant to do better. And everything they do wrong, we say, they were out to get me. And so we score it. And we have this idea that we, we have these outstanding debts from all these. And we like that because now they owe us. Now, here's the thing about the forget kind of forgiveness that God says. Remember, we, we talked about um, there's the legal and then there's the fellowship. But it's also, what is forgiveness then? If it's not like forgetting, what is true forgiveness? True forgiveness is no longer holding the debt. It's releasing the debt. It's saying, I will no longer use the debt. It's not forgetting what happened. We know that we're not going to be able to do that. But here's the thing is, so often we allow our feelings to determine if we've forgiven. So some of us still feel hurt when we think about it. We go, well, maybe I haven't really forgiven. Forgiveness is a choice. 
It's something you do and you say, but then the one act of it is, I will never hold them accountable for that again. They will no longer owe me. Now, let me tell you in my own life where I realize sometimes I say that, but I don't really mean it. I lent some money, a significant amount of money to a friend of mine one time. And, uh, and about a month later, God said, hey, just tell them they don't have to repay you. And, uh, and so I did. And then a couple months later, I show up at their house, and he's bought these little figurines from some show that he's watching. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Look what my money's bought. And then, and then every time I would go over there, whatever they have bought, I have judged whether that's a real, what they should have bought or what they shouldn't. Right? So I, deter- I walk in and I'm like, I can't believe that they wasted my money <laughs> on that. My money lasted forever, by the way. I mean, it was like, and I bought that and I bought, and I didn't even get, you know, I wasn't that significant, right? Now, I would never have bought that car with my money. But that's what it means where we, we think we've forgiven, but we're still acting as if there's something we have hold over. And so the, the forgiveness isn't necessarily feeling or saying that it was okay or that what they did was right or, or even saying I can't remember, but it's the idea that I am not going to keep it on the ledger. That means, spouses, that what happened 25 years ago that was the ultimate charge on the account, you have to say, I'm not bringing it up the next fight. Ooh. I see some of your faces now like, no, I like that. I like, I like that card. I got that card. You know, that's the Trump card. The ace of spades right here. Remember when? And so true forgiveness says, I give all that up, and I no longer say that I'm going to use that in the future. That's hard. That's really hard. So then the question is, is well, why should I really do that? Well, let's go back, or let's go to Matthew 6, chapter 12. I want you to catch this and forgive us our debts. Look at this little word that connects everything. As we also have forgiven. Do you see that? That's an aorist tense, or in our language, in Greek it's an aorist tense. In our language, a past tense. Have forgiven our debtors. What does that mean? We've already forgiven our debtors connects us to how God connects our debts to us. Or you go, are you sure that's what it says? Oh, well, let's just read a couple verses down. See how Jesus clarifies this. Here's Jesus saying, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins... Your father will what? Oh, that's got to be a mistake. Now, once again, this is not the legal thing. Like, if I don't forgive, then I don't, you know, then our relationship is, is not true. No, your relationship remains. But what it's saying is, to fellowship with our father, we must also, look, heavenly father. It connects this relationally, fellowship. But in order to have the right intimate relationship with the Father, we must also have, guess what, a right relationship with others. We must forgive. And and, and in fact, there's a parable that Jesus tells. It's a famous parable. It's in Matthew 18. And and Peter, being Peter, and if you know Peter, he's one of the apostles, and and really at the end, the, the, the the kind of apostle that was kind of the leader. And as he was the leader, he was always outspoken. And he's always trying to prove that he knows what Jesus is thinking. And so Jesus had kind of taught on forgiveness at one point in Matthew 18. And Peter goes, hey, Jesus, how often should we forgive? And of course, just so you know, the Jewish tradition was you had to forgive people three times. Most of you have run out of that, by the way. I mean, that might have been honeymoon for me and my wife. Three times she needed to forgive me at least three times then. And so, he, he, you know, Peter's like, oh, I'm going to say something awesome. He says, Jesus, how often should we forgive? Seven times? And he's like, 
three times two plus one. I mean, I am being super forgiving. And, and he's probably really proud of himself. And Jesus looks at him and says, no, Peter, it's 70 times seven. Now, some of you who are counting experts are like 490. I've got like three more left. No, what Jesus is really saying is it's uncalculable that, that you forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. Forgive. And then just to make the point, Jesus told the parable. He said, okay, there's a king. And he decides to call in all the debts. And so he calls in one servant, and the servant comes in, and the servant owes 10,000 talents of gold. So in our day, a talent of gold would be 20 years of income. So 200 thousand years this gentleman would have to work and work and work to eventually pay it off and that's if he's never spent another dime just so you know none of us live that long and so so the the servant just cries out to the king and says give me more time now that's silly right no matter how much time he has he's never paying that off but the king looks at him and has mercy and grace and says you know what i'm canceling your debt now, I don't know about you, but if somebody came to me today and my mortgage company rolled up and said, hey, by the way, I'm canceling your debt, I would be, I mean, just celebrating. I would, I, I'd be so excited. It'd be awesome, right? Whatever your largest debt might be, the fact of the matter, if somebody rolled up or called you and said, it is canceled, it is done, you'd be like, yeah. And maybe that's the way the servant was. But he walks out, and he sees his buddy, another servant. And his buddy owes him 100 denarii. Now, that's about three months' worth of wages. I mean, that's still significant. I mean, think about three, somebody owing you three months of what you make. And so he says, he says to this, this servant, he says, you need to pay me now. Maybe he's decided, I'm debt-free. If I can get this, I am really well off. I'm doing great. So he said, and the, and the servant does the same thing he did to the king and says, oh, please give me time and I'll repay. Except the first servant says no and puts him in debtor's prison. And his family in debtor's prison says, you'll repay. Now, can you imagine? I mean, you just got your largest debt, your mortgage, whatever paid off, that you went down to like your neighbor who you let borrow something or you gave him something and you said, okay, I want it back now. I mean, most of us, I would hope, would be like, we'd be calling some of those people like, hey, don't even worry about it. You can have it. I, you know, it's amazing. But yet, what Jesus says is what we do is this. That the king of kings, the one who we owe so many debts we could never possibly repay, has wiped it off our ledger, has forgiven us, and we walk in to others in our lives and we say, where is what you owe me? You owe me. And you know what it says the king did? The king brought that ser first servant back and he said, all of it's back on you now. That's how serious it says that God takes our unforgiveness. Why? Why does God care so much about us forgiving others? Well, it's pretty easy to understand that if we're supposed to be the picture of Christ to everyone around us, and we don't forgive, and we're out holding debts over people, we look no different than the world. Do you remember in John what Jesus declares? How will they know my people? What does he say? They will know them by my love, and they will know them by unity. That is the very opposite of being a creditor. In fact, we read in Matthew several times where Jesus says, especially within the body of Christ, not just talking about this church, but all of Christians, he says the number one thing the, that I want you to do is maintain and reconcile in relationships. I want you to be right with each other. The world's going to watch. I want, and so he does. He says things that are really hard. He says not only that um, if I have something 
uh, or if I've done something against you, says, I need to go to you and apologize and, and, and make right. But he also says, if you've done something to me and I know about it, I need to come to you and let you know what you've done. Now, just, so you, just to make clear, everything that you count as a debt really isn't in a debt. I'll say this, oftentimes we pick up offenses that aren't even sins towards us. Some of us are really good at this. Some of us are the king and queen of being offended. And some of us know those people, and some of us don't because you are that person. But the reality is, is it's so easy to go, you know what? I, and here's the number one. As spouses, can I tell you something? The number one offense that we pick up is when that person doesn't do what we expected them to do but never told them that we wanted them to do. Ever been in that place where you walk in and you're like, what? I, I've sinned against you. I didn't even know that was a thing that you wanted me to do. And so we understand, though, that when God calls us, that we should go and try to make it right. And we should try to make it so that the debt is canceled. Whether that's we owe someone else or whether we feel they owe us, the goal is to make it right as a body, especially because we reflect his forgiveness to the world. That we walk around as easy forgivers because we understand how much we've been forgiven. And it just should make it easy on us. And yet for many of us, we have a long ledger. And so to catch that literally, God says, your intimacy and fellowship with me is affected by your forgiving others. That should put a real fear of God in our spirit in holding debts. Right now, some of us are sitting here and we're like, whoa. Or, or some of us are realizing maybe the distance I felt from my father has to do with the fact that I've held my spouse or my sister or my coworker or someone within the body of Christ and I've held their debt over their heads, and I have not wanted to forgive them, and I want to hold it as a trump card. And God right now is saying, your distance you feel sometimes from me is because your choice not to forgive them. And now the question arises that might easily come is, well, what happens for the person who doesn't actually want to reconcile? If the goal is reconciliation, what happens if that person who's done me wrong refuses to admit they were wrong or, or has decided they're going to keep doing me wrong or maybe I can't even find them anymore. Like, I feel like they owe me a debt. I want to forgive them, but I can't find them. Or maybe they've even passed away and I've held a dead person to debt and I'm, when I see them in heaven, you know, I'm going to get it. And we don't, what do we do with those? Well, Jesus had an answer for that, and, and Paul talked about it. It's a unilateral forgiveness. It means I forgive regardless of whether they really want forgiveness. And then Paul tells us how we do this. In Romans, he's writing to Romans. In Romans chapter 12, verse 19, he says this. Remember, what is forgiveness? Choosing not to get that debt. Choosing not to take revenge. Choosing not to, to try to get repayment. That's forgiveness. And he says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. What is he saying? I'm a God of justice. And just like I paid for your sins through Christ, Christ on the cross, in order for me to be both loving and merciful and gracious, but also be just, someone had to pay, so Christ paid for your sins in my eyes. At the same time, Unilaterally, if someone who has done you wrong doesn't believe they've done wrong or has chosen to, to continue to do wrong, how do I forgive them? You forgive them by giving it to God as the collector. Now let me tell you folks, as, a, as understanding how God collects an injustice, I would rather have God as the collector than me because I don't know what that looks like all the time, but I've seen it. Remember what I talked about last week where that one person or the couple was trying to get the church out of the school and create a, a, a dysfunction within the relationship and was causing all those problems. And 
And I know when I found out who it was, my nature wanted to go knock on their door and um, be really nice and say, oh, I wish you wouldn't have, you know, that's not what I wanted to do. You know, but God, God said, no, it's mine to repay. And as you know, in the end, they did pay. And God's payment was much better. It created uh, money to even use for, you know, for, for ministries and other things. God's a great debt collector if people refuse to confess and repent. That there is a, there is a, the world, um, so, but it allows us to trust God. He is also gracious, right? And you might go, well, what happens if that person suddenly comes to God and he gives them grace and mercy? And you know what our, you know what our action should be? Praise the Lord. Because we didn't deserve ours. And it's awesome to have another brother and sister in Christ. Amen? I mean, we, we have an idea. Sometimes I think we'd rather God collect in the other way. But it would be awesome if God used our forgiveness for them, our refusal to try to pay them back. And they saw it, and God used it to bring them to himself and to offer grace and mercy for them. Wouldn't that be the ultimate payment? Wouldn't that be what God would ultimately want in that? So we, we by nature go, okay, God, I don't know how it's going to go. I don't know, but I'm not going to collect. I'm not the collector anymore. It's you. And you just forgive. And that's hard. Some of us right now are like, I don't like that idea. I need to see. I need to collect. I need to have. I need to see that payment wiped off. I want them to at least say they're sorry. I want to hear a confession of repentance that they're not going to do it again. And God says, that's not always going to happen, and yet I'm still calling you as my son or my daughter to stop trying to collect and forgive for my kingdom. Because he is a kingdom of love and mercy and grace, but justice, and we can trust him with it. And some of us right now, we need to trust him with it. God's calling you to a greater intimacy with him. God's love for you is so deep. He wants more for you, more of himself for you. He wants you to feel his grace and his mercy at a deeper level. And what's holding you back is your refusal to let someone else receive that same thing from you. People, don't walk out of here being a creditor. One, it's bad for you. But two, your father says it's going to affect your relationship or your fellowship with him. Some of us, uh, you know, emotions, the reality is, like I said, forgiveness is a choice. It's a decision. It's not emotion. It doesn't always match up with emotions. But here's the good news also for some of us here. We are in such desperate straits with God. We are so, we, we, we feel some of the things, maybe even as we talked about what God's called us to, and you're like, I've rationalized something for so long, and I'm stuck, and I just keep doing it, and it's not possible. I've asked for forgiveness a thousand times, and God can't possibly forgive it again. I'm stuck. Can I tell you, 1 John 1, 9 is as true for you today as it was the day John wrote it, that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You know what that means? It doesn't matter how you feel because the truth is God forgives. Amen? The truth is you're not stuck. The truth is you can have freedom. And so right now if you're, if you're really struggling with whether God can forgive you first, he can, he does, he has, and he will. He will. And so don't leave here also feeling indebted to God. Rather just go to him and confess your sin. And he is faithful and just to forgive because he loves you. And so today, uh, the calling on us all is, we, don't, we, we can have a perfect ledger. You know what accountants really like? When it's zero, zero, zero at the bottom. <laughs> Some of you accountants are like, yeah, yeah. When, uh, you know, because back in the day when you were doing it by hand, it was like, if it was messed up, it was like, uh-oh. And, you know, and that's what God wants in our life. Because the peace that we feel when we know we don't know God 
and we know in, 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 in the fellowship with him, and when we know that no one owes us, and there's a peace there because that's where God wants us. And that will reflect to all those in our life and all those in this neighborhood when they can look and see, you know what's cool about the church of Stone Valley? They don't hold debts. Will you pray with me? Father, today, this is rough. This is hard. Sitting on my porch thinking about where I may have hurt others or where, God, I still judge what they're spending my money on or, God, whatever else it is that I've, I've maintained a, a ledger, God, and to look at that and release it because, God, some of those hurts are deep. Some of those hurts have scars that will never go away. When I think about it, it brings it to just, I feel it almost like it happened yesterday. And I know there are others in this room that have those same things, those same hurts. And maybe even if they were to be honest, the one sitting next to them has hurt them. And, and at night on their own, they've cried out, I will never forgive that. Father, help us forgive. If there's others here today who they are struggling with receiving the forgiveness you have for them, they've been living a life of shame and of hurt, and, and God, they know that what they're doing or have done has hurt you, has hurt others, and so they just, they, they've done it over and over, and they've prayed and they've prayed, but now, God, they just quit because they are like, I can't possibly for, be forgiven anymore. May they receive the good news that you never run out of grace. You tell us in Romans that no matter how deep sin happens, that grace is more. May they receive your grace today. And may we pass on your grace to others in the amount we've received. And Lord, may you use that to bring your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And I ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. This morning, uh, we have communion. And if you haven't gotten the communion stuff, you can go back. I'll give you just a couple of seconds to go back there or minutes to go back there and grab it. Um, It's always, you know, we talk about this kind of idea of the 10,000 talents, like what God's really done for us and the forgiveness that we have. If we could only, I, I wonder what it would really look like for us if we could see what our sin looks like against his holiness and what he's done to remove that. And then we're, today, as we take communion, the whole idea of this that Jesus said is to remember what, what he's done. To remember that it wasn't anything we can do. We can't work it out. We can't uh, be good for a certain amount of time. You know, none of those things remove the debt. Because the debt is incurable from our end. But Jesus paid it all. If you need help, you can just push the tab down and that will help you get the, the bread out at the top. And we find Jesus talking to the disciples in Matthew 26, verse 26. And it says, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat it, this is my body. And then he took a cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood that establishes the new covenant. It is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Father, oh, thank you for Jesus. Without him, we would be eternal debtors and far from you, separated from you because sin has no place in your kingdom. But God, Christ justified us through his 
life. May today we receive that. And it says in verse 29, But I tell you from this moment, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it in a new way in my Father's kingdom with you. What a promise. And that gives us hope. And after singing hit psalms, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Will you stand and sing with us in closing? That you would be mindful of us. What do you see? That's worth looking away. We are free. Just want to remind you, if you could help 
you think about driving or you have airlines miles, you can see me, you can email me later in the week. That would be awesome. Uh, if you're a guest with us, we would love for you to go back to the Welcome Center. But I do want to say this. Many of us, I see your faces, I know, in the first service as well, that there are people who are struggling with forgiveness. You have a deep, deep hurt, and you don't even know if you can, and you, you don't want to walk out of here with it, but you feel caught. I want to encourage you. We have prayer team that will be back over here in these double doors. And today, just take a moment to stop and ask someone to pray with you. Um, it tells us in the Bible, exhort one another uh, daily. So we want to exhort and encourage you. And so if you're struggling, don't leave here. You know, you may not yet be able to release it. It may just be such a stranglehold on your life. But don't leave without at least asking God to help you with that burden. Will you pray with me? Father, help us. We know that our, our desire is always for repayment, for revenge, for um, collection. God, that's just who we are in our flesh. But God, in our new spirit, we desire to be free to have peace between us and others, and therefore peace with you, God. That our fellowship will be unhindered, that our intimacy will grow, not just with you, God, and, and that's where it starts, but God, with our fellow man, even those who've hurt us. Lord, help us find reconciliation, not for our own glory or name, but for yours. And we ask all this in Jesus' name, the one who made perfect reconciliation available to us. And all of God's people said, amen.